Mobile Hawk is the world's most sophisticated unmanned aircraft. NASA's acquisition of these aircraft are the first by a civilian agency. And so that gives us an opportunity to show how we might use these for our science. This capability is our future. GLOPAC is the Global Hawk Pacific mission. GLOPAC is the first scientific mission that is being flown on the Global Hawk aircraft. Before this aircraft was, was acquired by NASA, it was used for actually military reconnaissance. The Global Hawk is a fully autonomous aircraft. It doesn't have any operators on board. The Global Hawk can fly to 65,000 feet. It has a wingspan that's just a little longer than the wingspan of a 737. Um, a long wingspan allows you to get to higher altitudes. You can fly over 30 hours continuously. It has a range of over 10,000 nautical miles. The Global Hawk can take off from California and get all the way up to the high Arctic. Plus, it can go all the way to the equator. And so it's a really capable plane in terms of duration and altitude, much more than any manned aircraft we've ever used. The value of the GLOPAC mission really is twofold. One, it's showing how an unmanned aircraft of the capabilities of the Global Hawk can be used for the benefit of Earth science. This aircraft significantly expands our capability. And second, we, we will gather some very important information from the atmosphere during Volcan to tell us about the distribution of gases and aerosols in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. The upper troposphere and lower stratosphere is a very important region of the atmosphere to study. One of the reasons is it's not very often studied because of its the difficulty of getting there. Satellites routinely sample that region, but not as with the same kind of precision that you might like. So we'd like to do more process-based studies in that region. There's a total of 10 instruments aboard the Global Hawk for the GLOPAC mission. Um, these instruments break into two kinds. One is what we call a remote sensor, which measures things far away. We have another type of instrument we call an in situ instrument, and this measures the air that the aircraft is actually flying through. They will measure particular gases, like ozone, water, um, nitrous oxide or laughing gas, plus temperatures, pressures, winds, and so forth. The other thing is we're very interested in validation of the Aura satellite. The Aura satellite measures ozone-depleting gases and ozone. The second thing it does is Aura measures various gases involved with air quality. So it's a validation experiment. You have to make sure that your satellite instruments are still measuring what you originally intended for them to measure. One of the, the great things about this aircraft is it can be configured for a wide range of payloads. Payloads can be mounted underneath the nose of the aircraft, uh, under the belly of the aircraft, in the rear tail area. There's several bays on the side of the aircraft that are available. Uh, on top near the front of the aircraft, under the radome. So on the airplane itself, We've identified over 14 different compartments that are available for payloads. We've added six iridium links for global payload communication. There's also four on there for the, for the aircraft command and control. So we're actually carrying 10 iridium systems on the airplane. The iridium is an array of satellites. You can be anywhere on the Earth and, and you're within iridium coverage 24-7. And so it's a great way for us to talk to the airplane and get downlink data from the aircraft no matter where it is in the world. With most aircraft, the people are either sitting in the aircraft, and so they're watching their measurements as the airplane is flying through certain air, or they're on the ground, and you don't see your data until after the plane is landed. With the Global Hawk, though, everybody's sitting in a room called Global Hawk Operations Center, and you're viewing your data as it's being measured. So you get to see your data in real time. Well, the G-Hawk, our Global Hawk Operations Center, it's uniquely divided into two rooms. We've got the flight operations, group in the front. In the back room we have a fully independent capability for our payload scientists. So we've got 14 workstations there, each one dedicated to supporting an individual instrument. And we have all the instrument operators sitting in this back room. They can talk to their instruments and, and make subtle corrections to the computer programming of the instrument or they can send it into a different sampling mode. So it's really an interactive process now. So it's a new way of doing science. When we are controlling the NASA Global Hawk, it's a whole different challenge. It's more like being a cross between a, 
an air traffic controller and a pilot because you have this bird's eye view of the aircraft. It's a very sort of a disconnected experience. We have to really focus on where it is, how it's going to react, uh, when I give it commands, how long is it going to take. It's a lot of the basic airmanship, uh, but it, the hand-eye coordination is, is a lot different. Uh, it's uh, mouse screen coordination. If you're a, an airplane pilot, then to think of the possibility of leaving that and uh, start flying an airplane that's remotely controlled and using a mouse and a keyboard. That's a big paradigm shift. But as I got more and more involved in it and started to search it out and realizing the potential of the Global Hawk aircraft and its impact on the science world, I became more and more enamored with it. The Gulf Hack mission is really a partnership of a number of federal agencies and private industry and universities. NASA is the ones who own and operate these planes, but that's a partnership with both NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and Northrop Grumman, the people who have built these planes. The GLOPAC mission is a great example of the collaboration between NASA and NOAA. Both agencies share an interest in the future of unmanned aircraft for their particular program. And those of us in the GLOPAC mission see ourselves as early adopters, and it's very clear already that a success of this aircraft will have a lot of ramifications because people's imaginations will be engaged as to what else we could do now that we've demonstrated for the first time that putting scientific instruments on board and taking it far away from home is, is a good idea and can be done in a successful way. I really think that this is really a, a historic occasion for us. It's because we're on the cusp of something new we're on the cusp of using a plane that's basically a satellite as well as a plane. We can venture out into the regions where a lot of the weather in the United States forms, but is so remote from us that we can't get to it. And so that information is now going to be used to improve forecasts, it'll be used to improve our policies towards air quality and climate change and ozone depletion. It's a new way of doing things for us, and I think that's what makes you think that we're really doing something exciting and new and historic.